Yo, what's up? It's the Agassino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agassino Zynga, and this is episode number 507. That's 507 of the Agassino Zynga Show. How you doing, my friends? How are you doing? Great, amazing. How am I? Doing the best I can with the time that I have available, putting one foot in front of the other and trying to make the best of whatever situation that we are seeing ourselves in at this current moment. If it's your first time watching the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash a like, hit subscribe, leave a comment down below. If you listen via the podcast app, please leave me a five-star review, four-star review, three-star review, two-star review, one-star review, wherever you can. Just engage with the review system so that I can creep up the algorithm charts and people can find my show and discover it as you have discovered it too. And of course, support via Patreon is also more than welcome. That patreon.com for just Agostino. You can find a link to my Patreon in the description of this show, whether you're watching this on YouTube or listening to on your favorite podcast app click the description there'll be a link there to support the show support it it's only one dollar equivalent of one pound per month and you get access to all my bonus content on there so don't delay get involved on patreon today hope you're well wherever you may be i'm recording us at some time in like what 4 a.m on a sunday because i couldn't sleep so why not just create content do the best thing that i can do which is create 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 i've been reading a ton i've been staying up late a ton um, downloading music since I got this new USB man my life has just been the whole constant barrage of making sure my library sorted out you know what actually my USB dying on me was actually a real blessing in disguise I think I mentioned it beforehand um, did I mention it before I think I did I think I mentioned it before but anyway I did buy a new USB right I bought one of those um, SanDisk Extreme Pros right they're like 50 quid or 40 quid 40 to 50 pounds right depending on the price or where you might shop from and for someone like myself um, who tends to always kind of go for whatever method works I don't go to the low cost option I just go for whatever method works straight away and then as I kind of progress in the craft and then start to kind of like increase my um my uh, tech right and the tools i use in terms of the quality of it i'm not really believing going i'm not a big believer in going out and just buying the best of the best straight away i think you should just obviously it's like um the equivalent of like starting on a pair of starting to dj on a pair of new marks belt drive yeah turntables I'd rather do that than go straight away and go get a tall Technic 12 tens. Even though the Technic 12 tens are obviously few, not few, they're obviously sturdy, they're obviously really high quality, they're obviously the industry standard. If I was DJing first of all and I didn't know if I was gonna like it or not, I'd start with the belt drives, obviously perfect my Technic there, and then by the time I get onto the 12 tens, I would have been good enough to a level that I would make the 12 ten look like toys. You know what I mean? As opposed to go straight to the 12 tens, get it kind of overawed by the equipment, and then not kind of revisit it again. So I did the same thing with the USB. I bought like a five pound one, which is probably just meant for work or whatnot, which is pretty solid. It still was. It used to read and write really quickly, and as time progressed, it sort of kind of deteriorated especially with the lack of um, space on it and then um now i use yeah so i using that for a bit i was using that when i went to the studio the other day to record my set obviously if you've been watching my channel you would have seen i created a new set called test miss 58 it's my series of mixes that i've been doing for the best part of what three plus years or something now i'm doing them obviously more regularly because i'm not booked and busy unfortunately so i'm trying to occupy my friday nights with a couple dj sets i'm going to probably end up again it's quite expensive to go because it's like 21 pound every session you go which obviously adds up in a month but i want to do this probably every friday i'd much rather kind of you know tie my belt and you know not spend money on other things and do the 21 quid and just record a set and obviously upload it I think it's really beneficial for myself, obviously, to practice on my equipment and to kind of keep putting it out there that I DJ to a proficient enough level that I can get booked in places, right? So just kind of keep that out there. So that's what I'm doing. And then obviously I was doing it one day. I was trying to record. I messed up the recording. And then for whatever reason, my USB just crashed on me. I just heard whistling in the kind of coming back off the flipping mixer. And I was like, oh no, plugged it into my computer. And then when I went to upload, when I went to open record box, the application that you use to kind of sort all your tunes out and put them onto a USB so that they can work on the Pioneer um, CDJs. I got a message that said basically error in it. You have to kind of delete your USB. It wouldn't even recognize my files. Like no way. So I had to delete it. But then luckily, the actual raw files, the MP3s, are still on there. But it's just the data of the record box is gone, which is not bad. I mean, all things considering. So hopefully those files aren't corrupted. I'll put them back onto my new USB. And now my new USB, I have to kind of um, uh, edit them, of course. I've got to edit all the tags, you know, make sure the titles are all right. 
um, and all that stuff, put them in folders. But it's actually a blessing in the sky because I think before my record box or my library was just too full. There's too much stuff in it. And I didn't sort it out in terms of like opener, peak, you know, all that sort of stuff, right? I just kind of had it all kind of clumped in together. Because um, usually when I sort out my playlist, I usually have it as, I usually have it as what I'm going to play as opposed to like what fits into a certain time of set, which is what I should be doing. Because before I saw what I did, did do, I'd have like openers, I'd have like, you know, pre-peak, I'd have peak, I'd have like, you know, um, after hour sort of vibe sorted out in folders so that it's easier to kind of go and grab a tune straight away as opposed to like going through the set list. I mean, it's a bit harder to, to read. So here I am, man. What can you do? Um, But yeah, happy with the mix that I recorded the other day. There's obviously a clear upgrade in the difference in terms of levels from 57 to 58 i'm sure probably most of you have probably seen it 57 of course you couldn't see it probably because the video camera wasn't working but in terms of actual quality of the mix it shows as per usual these sort of things it's like running if you do it more regularly you obviously become more proficient at it. and you know it's no surprise that when i was playing every week monday or well, thursday to sunday djing out in places right it's no surprise i got so good so quickly and it's no surprise that i was actually you know um, at the probably my highest, I think, level of proficiency because again, you have to remember, I was playing in like a really shitty pub in Westfield Stratford, right? And that's not really you know the, the most um, eclectic crowd in the world, but still, I had to kind of keep those guys occupied. Then I switched to like a warehouse space. Then I switched to like a you know a little cafe bar place in Hackney Week or something that wanted a different sort of vibe. So I was able to cover every sort of remit in terms of sounds, and then I have to also have to keep people on the dance floor. So my proficiency and my level of kind of application was super high first to sunday every single time on fucked up equipment sometimes that hardly worked you kind of get better really really quickly and i think obviously i realized that um that was a major thing and that's why i actually took the decision to not to kind of do the standard promoting thing that everyone was doing um in terms of how to put yourself out there as a dj where you just kind of go and play for all the you know most popular nights and popping nights it obviously it's a harder way to get in but still if you really want to be a serious person you know maybe that is the best route to go but i always wanted to get really good at djing i always wanted to be a really really good dj like somebody that people say okay i'm like um what's that word called a local legend or something right it's like, oh yeah this guy's really good and no one really knows who he is so that when i finally do get the opportunity to play on like a big stage you know i'm of the level i'm i'm i can meet that standard straight away i don't have to kind of like you know ease my way in or learn no 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 no. i've been playing to crowds like for a very very long time um just not the kind of trendy crowds or the cool crowds but i have been playing for crowds and this obviously shows when i play so i'm really happy with that um and that's going great so hopefully that kind of progresses and things go well with that what's been happening that's about it really isn't it that's really about it i'm not gonna lie not really much going on um you know trying to keep my head down working a bunch obviously with sober october not really much to do in terms of going out wise i was gonna go to a little private art gallery thing of central london but again i can't be bothered like um covid has really kind of made me lazy in terms of going out in terms of kind of doing my extracurricular activities don't get me wrong i'm obviously going away to berlin soon so that's obviously one thing that i'm doing um making an effort to kind of do that but in terms of just going out out like i'm so lazy man like honestly like i think covid really broke my will to kind of just go out and explore and get lost and hang out for hours and hours outside i prefer just to stay indoors you know um uh, be a voyeur on other people's instagram stories check sub videos on youtube yeah you know i mean go on twitter and stuff like read a book like I, I prefer to do that and then to actually go outside and see people and hang out with strangers but when, when i'm outside i love it do you know what i mean it's the one thing that actually brings me legit joy but you know what can you do man i guess it's the consequences or the it's it's a, one of those kind of long covid effects you know what there's long COVID effects people say oh yeah um I've not been able to taste, my breathing's all fucked up. One thing people don't really talk about too much is, you know, people's, you know, will and desire to go out has definitely changed. I know mine has, so, you know, we are where we are. We are where we are. Next on list I was going to talk about, um, oh yeah, it's what I'm talking about. Man United v Leicester. So, United lost against Leicester the other day, 4-2 away from home. Um, the result was quite surprising, I have to be honest, um, especially the manner of how we lost, because I think despite how poorly we played in the second half i think we played pretty well the first 25 minutes or so of that game against leicester 
I thought that we saw the good and the bad of United, I think, up front in that kind of final third. We've got some proficient enough players that we can hurt teams, especially if they play open. We saw Sancho and Greenwood earlier on get forward. You know, Bruno Fernandes trying to look for Ronaldo a couple of times. Pogba really roaming around, basically leaving Matic to be the only kind of deep landing playmaker. They weren't really playing in tandem, really, for the most part, especially in that first half. Pogba was mostly on the left. <clears throat> But then we also saw the negatives where that if we do concede a goal, it feels like this team kind of knows that if we concede the goal, it puts too much pressure on the attacking players to outscore the other team. Like we're not going to shut out a team, especially a team like Leicester who kind of have a style of play. They have a way of kind of exploiting spaces. They have a way of kind of stretching our team. They have a way of just attacking in general as a team and pressing as a team that you know our players aren't going to necessarily thrive under those conditions. And to start off with the game, I think the lineup I wasn't that I wasn't that kind of I didn't have that much of a problem with. The only thing I kinda of pointed out social media was a midfield. I was kinda of worried about that three as Matic, Pogba and Bruno. more so because of the Pogba and Bruno thing. I just don't think they can play together in that kind of system. It just doesn't work. Maybe as like a flat four, a flat three, a flat five or something cool. But in that kind of triangle sort of um four three three or in that yeah, in that kind of four two three one formation, it just doesn't work. Or four two one two one, it doesn't work. It really doesn't. Um, Bruno goes wandering too much. He gets attracted to the ball. He really wants to be in the box anyway. As we saw last season, he's probably better playing as a false nine than he is playing as a number ten. He doesn't really have the ball control, ball manipulation, um, dribbling ability. Um, you know that little five yard of pace that Aquatino has got to really play in that position well. He's not really a modern day number ten. He's probably more like an like a what like an eight or something. Even then, he's not the most like box to box dynamic sort of player, right? But once he gets in around that box, he's deadly, as you can see, right? His shooting is ridiculous. Um, his finishing level is ridiculous. Like it's just really really good. But uh, as a footballer, he's just not the best. So. With those guys in the midfield and with Pogba's tendency not to be defensively disciplined, to go wandering, and obviously his ball retention skill isn't that great, even despite how big he is, he does kind of lose the ball under pressure quite often. I was really worried about that. But then I was also thinking back in my head, Matic and Pogba playing as a double pivot might actually work because they're both really good on a ball from those kind of deep positions. Pogba with his sprays, Matic with those kind of through the line kind of balls that he does where it kind of goes through this way, right? And Pogba kind of flings it right to left. I thought that would work in that respect, but as it, as the game progressed and we needed to defend more and there was more runners coming in and behind, I found that Pogba and, and Matic were really struggling in that position. And it kind of goes to show that if you're going to play two double pivots in that position, they have to be, in my opinion, a very proficient, high-level DM alongside one of either, you pick, I don't care who it is, Matic, no, one of either, no, yeah, let's say Matic is the, is the one that you, you picked as a deep landing play, a deep landing defensive midfielder because you ain't got nobody else. Then you have to pick one of McTominay, Fred or Van Der Beek to play alongside him. No one else can do that role. And then the rest, and then the number 10 position has to be fought over between Bruno Fernandes and Pogba. I think they occupy the same spaces. So you have to decide who you want to play in that role or you push Pogba on the left-hand side, but you don't put him in the midfield. It's just not going to work. So that was obviously a concern. But the rest of that, I was okay with the lineup. But then again, 20 minutes in, we started pretty well. Well, Marcus, sorry, Mason Greenwood scored an absolutely banger of a goal for the left-hand side. He just picked up as he always does when he's playing um, up front with Ronaldo. He doesn't seem to pass him too much. He just he's probably encouraged to shoot a lot by the manager, and he scored a quite brilliant goal. Um, maybe some people would argue the shooting. And that scoring of a goal was a kind of um, a one-off. And maybe the more he the more time often than not, when he does shoot, he does not score, right? Especially from that distance. So maybe the fact that he was shooting so much was maybe a hindrance to the other team and how we are playing. I'm not too sure. But regardless of that, he scored. We felt like we were going to get our tails up and kind of go for it from there. Then, you know, they equalized pretty uh pretty well i think in the regards of how they were playing um obviously a mistake from us in the back with harry Maguire, who looked horrible he was clearly not fit he was clearly um carrying some sort of injury and he clearly got rattled by the leicester fan base i think as soon as he made that first mistake that led to the yuri tillman's goal his kind of head went down he sort of retreated and did what normal defenders do whenever they're not confident he just took a five yard step back he took five yards um he took five a five yard step back, right? Is that what I say? Yeah, backwards. It doesn't being deep and then invited more pressure. And then from then on, it was only one team that was going to win this game. And then at that time, I think at half time, I said, you know what? 
considering the games that we have coming up, we have Atlanta in the Champions League. I think we've got Liverpool and Tottenham or something, right? Um, I think we've got, yeah, away in the home. I'm not too sure what, what way, it go, way it goes around. But basically, I was saying that I would much rather leave this game with a draw, playing against Leicester, considering how poor we are, um, and then go into the Atlanta, Atlanta games and the Liverpool games with like a fresh, clean slate. Because more likely than not, we're probably going to turn up against Liverpool, right? Even though everyone thinks it's going to get bad, we're probably going to play really well against them. It always happens on United, especially Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Whenever he needs a result, he'll pull one out of the bag. So don't be surprised if we end up winning 4-2 against Liverpool. But then against Atalanta, I was saying that I really do worry about this team if we get knocked out of the Champions League and the likes of Varane and Ronaldo and co are having to play in the Europa League, especially after all the investments happening, especially after the divide in the fan base. I think it's going to get really toxic really quickly. So that, especially considering how easy our group was on paper. So I thought, you know what, get get out of Leicester with a point. Again, we should be winning those kind of games if you want to challenge for a title. But let's be honest, we're not going to challenge for a title anytime soon. And then going to the Atlanta, Atlanta game, because it's the Champions League again, knockout tournament. There's no, you know, um, there are obviously favourites, but there is still a possibility that we could do something. Do you know what I mean? So I thought maybe that could work, but it didn't work. We ended up getting embarrassed against Leicester, which is then going to put more pressure against Atalanta, which is then going to put even more pressure again against Liverpool. And then Tottenham, of course, they're struggling for form. They would want to kind of show and prove against us too. And that's going to be an issue too. So it's going to be a really interesting run of games. Um, but regardless, I thought um, the substitutions were weird when they did happen. Um, the fact that Sancho is always the first player to come off and Rashford obviously was the first player to come on was, you know, um, system systematic or systemic of whatever, Oli Gunnar's reign. The fact that he has his favourites. Some players get all the leniency, some players don't. Van der Beek didn't come on the pitch. McTominay did before him to try and win the game, which is ludicrous if you, if you kind of really think about it. Um, and just Ronaldo stayed in the pitch probably too long. He was probably really ineffective, I thought, in general. Um, and just in general, I just think, the really unfortunate thing about Oli is that he had so much goodwill going into this job and clearly he's done a lot of good post Mourinho, right? The toxicity levels that existed with Mourinho were just too much to bear. And if anyone wants a repeat of that, and obviously the Van Gaal era had its kind of, you know, had its positives, but still, um, I think overall the style of football we were playing, um, it just wasn't what we wanted to see and it kind of got really boring really quickly. No problem with that one. And obviously he didn't get the support he needed. There was no football director. All this sort of stuff didn't really help his reign. But the really interesting or side thing about Oli is that it's such a wasted opportunity. He's clearly not, you know, of the elite quality that we need as a coach. But you would have imagined somebody like him would have recognised that and just brought in some high level coaches just to help him be successful at the club. If he was so worried, because you know he always kept saying about, "Oh, I'm more worried about the club's success. It's not about me. I'm here as a servant of the club." It's like, yeah, but he's done everything to sort of like you know keep his friends in the job even though they're not good enough them characters mckenna's the mike feelings and stuff they're not elite coaches they shouldn't be coaching a team of that sort of quality and especially if you want to compete with the other teams in the league it just doesn't really make sense to me because it's clearly this way of playing of where you just get your best players and you put them in a competent formation and hope they figure it out on the pitch it doesn't work we only have one way of playing, which is counter-attacking. We don't really build out from the back that well. We don't have the players even to build out from the back. I don't. I would say Harry Maguire and Lindelof are fairly average when it comes to playing with the ball out, out from the back with their feet. Wan Bissaka and Luke Shaw are hot and cold in that kind of department. And our attacks just don't have any rhyme or reason to them. I think when we do get the ball to a Bruno, to a Pogba, to a Sancho, to a Greenwood, they kind of figure it out. But in terms of actual building of a play system uh system systematic or systemic attacks whatever that word is we don't do that we just kind of you know our better players just figure out how to score goals in the end and i think ultimately that's going to what's going to cost him <clears throat> his job and most likely the mcfred dependency is also going to cost him his job because i don't care anyone says i don't think ollie ever wanted a dm because he's been in the job for three years um he has not made any kind of inkling that he's going to sign one apart from Declan Rice. I've not heard of any other rumours. Again, Declan Rice is not a realistic option. Let's be, let's be real. He's going to cost upwards of like 90 million. Doesn't make any sense. So if that's the case, I've not heard of us speaking to <clears throat> with any other DM apart from this Chumani guy. Again, he's young. He's just come out, you know, out from the blue. And I think we should be, again, kind of calm about his ability to play in the Premier League, especially after we've seen what happened to flipping in Dombele. I mean, it's not guaranteed that a player coming straight from the French League is going to come and tear up the Premier League. That's a little bit um, naive to think that. But in general, he's not made any intonation that he wants to sign a DM. So he's clearly happy with McFred um, to a certain extent. He trusts them for whatever reason. And ultimately, McFred 
and the lack of playing system and styles of play is what's going to cost him his job. So again, maybe an illustration of what how poor of a judge of a character is in football players that he's picking those two guys and those guys why he's going to get not have the job in the end. But it's a waste of opportunity, I think, going forward. And I'm really worried because I also don't trust the board to hire a coach a manager who's gonna do a good job or to give him the tools or the platform necessary for him to do a good job the only positive i'd say with that is that because ollie's been in we now have a football director even though he's not good and not high level in that john murto guy he was around when david Moyes was around he's not exactly you know a european finest he's not the best in class as someone like a guy never would say but again he hasn't he's been really quiet about that side of things but <clears throat> I'm not I'm not confident that Glazers can go and select a right coach that's gonna take us to the next level because there's part of me that thinks there's no ready made option out there that's gonna do that, right? <clears throat> if you go to a Conte, you have to change your philosophy and your player recruitment strategy straight away. He's a, he's kind of basically um a modern day version of a Mourinho. So that probably might not be a good enough option. And then the other managers are more so a risk right because they they would need a lot of structure around them to bring the best out of them right you look at like a 10 hog at ix he's not just a man just going to come in and just kind of you know tear up the rule book and do his thing straight away he still needs to have those processes around the structure similar how, he's, how he has in ix to bring that the best in him and to obviously allow him to kind of play the football that he wants these teams to play so do I see those guys doing that? Probably not. I think they're going to do the same thing they did before, revert to type, get the best quote-unquote manager on paper, and then kind of hope signings are going to fix everything. I don't think that's the case. I think now, especially with the quality of the league and the standard of it, you just need to have better coaches. You need to have better players. You, need, you, know, you need to have better coaches. You need to have better styles of play. And obviously, some good players here and there. But for the most part, the coaching level, um, the tactics, all that sort of stuff needs to be of a right level. Even the player recruitment in terms of not only having to buy like 50 million players, 50 million plus players all the time sometimes maybe a couple of 20s and 10 and 30s just to kind of fill it fill in the, the squad and to make it more balanced or more, more well-rounded might be a good way to go about things i think but yeah we've got a lot of issues man we've got ronaldo for another year he's clearly not the Ronaldo we knew and loved he's clearly diminished in some way shape or form or limited in his ability to influence the game you can obviously still finish in a box but in terms of him being an out and out quality player that he was before that's not the same so there's a lot of issues going on there Bruno Fernandes you know obviously Pogba this contract situation um it's a real shit show to be honest but you know what can you do man what can you do? The only good thing I think about it as well is Ronaldo. Clearly, I think in the interview with Pogba after the game, you look obviously quite annoyed, but the Ronaldo clearly signing has influenced or affected how we are approaching management or the co or Oli's situation for sure. Um, the pressure that it puts on him to have a player like Ronaldo playing in that team, the fact that, you know, he player like that doesn't want to play in the Europa League it goes to show that you know that signing was a blessing and a curse a blessing obviously because you got one of the best players in the world um but a curse also because he is the profile of player that just demands title challenges and champions league challenges and stuff do you know what I mean and at the moment we're just so far away from that it's not even funny man but hey what can you do Next on this, what else we got to talk about? Oh, yeah, we've got this, and this is a random topic, right? But I don't know if you guys remember this, but a few years ago, right, there was this guy, like a contemporary artist who popped up on the scene who everyone was talking about. Because, again, um, having, having uh, maybe you guys don't know my history, but having studied at a very famous and illustrious art university here in the UK called Central St. Martins and just being, you know, an avid... Um, artist myself from the time I was in school and whatnot you know I went to a pretty decent art school when I was in college um you know won lots of competitions all that sort of blah 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 shit um I just follow art in general I go to the private views um you know I go to galleries all the time museums all that kind of good stuff and in general I kind of keep myself abreast all the news and one of the places I keep myself abreast is a website called Artnet and I remember a few years ago Artnet Art Forum a place that I was meant to intern at a few years ago, but that kind of didn't work out. But that was a funny little experience. I'll probably explain another time. But there was a time period, I think early 2000s, maybe around then, maybe a 2005 period, that this guy's name popped up. Or 2005, 2010, I don't know what time. Anyway, this guy's name popped up called um, Christian Rosa. And everyone was kind of talking about him like the next prodigal kind of superstar contemporary artist, right? Um, he had a very, what would you say, uh, would you call it mirror? I'm not going to say mirror. I don't know what, how do you call his style, but 
he had a very kind of contemporary style that you would have thought would have done really well and again he was commanding high prices and kind of auctions and shit and just being like associated with the right people right galleries right representation he just seemed like there's only one way up for him in it right especially how he looks and stuff you know cool kid da -da -da -da, <clears throat> handsome guy and then for whatever reason it went quiet or i haven't really heard nothing about him for a long time and i think i just found out why so this is courtesy of art and it's the story from like early 21 right early 2021 yeah february so it says here everything's coming up roses um it says two weeks wet paint um wet paint unspoil unspoil a twisted and strange tale of a friendship undone by an alleged forgery sources did tell his allegations that a young artist christian rosa the guy up top had taken an unfinished work from the studio of mentor and legendary raymond pettibon who you might know you know most recently for doing that collaboration with um supreme but you know he's an amazing artist his own right so yeah, um, uh, had taken an unfinished work from the studio of Mentor and the legendary Raymond Pottibond, finished it himself and attempted to sell it for more than $1 million. Advisor with knowledge of the deal indicated that the work came close to selling, which makes sense. A large Pettibond wave painting for a million bucks would be a steal. That is unless the work itself was stolen as multiple sources suggested. In the weeks that followed, nearly a dozen additional sources close to the birth of the artist came forward with with more information snitches about Rosa's long relationship with Pettibon. Four of them indicated that based on the formation information that they have, um, rather than the isolated alleged incident, the talented wave painting may have been the tainted wave painting may have been one of the least free said to have been taken from Pettibon and later put on the market. So this guy again, like proper scumbag behavior. This guy Christian Rosa, the guy that everyone was kind of billing up to be the next great art superstar had you know befriended raymond pettibon again a great artist in his own right because i think if i'm not mistaken he was a lecturer at one of his guest lecturers or something at one of his universities they built up a friendship obviously over time um he then gets invited to hang out at his house which is crazy right to go to raymond pettibon's home and live with him and be amongst his family and see his work and kind of just have access to that entire thing because i'd imagine being an artist especially and living in that it kind of basically it's not an artist residency but basically being able to learn from your mentor in that way must be or inspiring right just to be around him i can imagine for me like doing djing stuff if i got the opportunity to just like you know carry fucking dj harvey's bags or just to be around you know ricardo villalobos and why he's flipping kept sweats away from his forehead i'd be i'd love it right jeremy you know I mean? there'd be no um, inkling in my head where I want to take his headphones or whatever, do you know what I mean? I, I wouldn't give a shit. I just want to absorb him as a person, see how he kind of interacts with the crowd, how he selects his tunes, what he does with a you know with a set list, like all that kind of stuff is why I want to learn visually and just through just being there, right, in proximity to him. I wouldn't care about anything else or stealing drinks from his flipping rider. That's flipping ridiculous. So to even do that is a high level of disrespect, and then to go and do it and try and sell the works to profit off of it, especially considering he is um on his way to being like the next great art superstar, is really scumbaggy as well. Maybe his situation was that poor that he had to kind of do that. He had no what nothing else to do. His back was against the wall, and maybe he had some addiction issues that he was trying to pay that money for. I don't know, but I think that's the real scumbag thing. Someone invites you into their home, and then you go and steal stuff from their house, and then try and sell it. It's a like, yuck. Um, it continues that the relationship between the two artists began over a decade ago when Petty Bon here, see, met Rosa um, through artist Daniel Richter, uh, another really famous one who was teaching the rise and start at the Academie de Berlin Kunst in Vienna, Switzerland. Um, in 20, 2010, Rosa took a road trip out to West to visit Petty Bon, crashed at his Venice Beach home, which doubled as his studio. A source present at the time said that in his recollection, Pettibon had works on paper around the studio and Rosa took some unfinished works from the studio, the finished works that he would later finish himself and offer for sale. In a statement to Wet Paint, representative of her in Pettibon studio said that the artist never purposely gave any works to Christian Rosa and had no knowledge of Rosa having the works. Fucking nuts, isn't it? But they also got to show the... Pro, the, pro, the what's, it, uh, what's it called? The, the proficiency or the... Pro, what's that word called? Um, how prolific somebody like a Raymond Pettibon is that he's got so many paintings or stuff that hasn't been done just lying around right that are all worth millions and millions of pounds hundreds of thousands of pounds that he could have not noticed somebody taking a couple of his kind of greater works and kind of finishing them on their own accord it's just absolutely insane it just goes to show man like the highest level artists don't really care about the money that much I mean they're just about expressing themselves and getting their vision out there into the world and obviously um, this Christian Rosa guy took advantage of that that's the real again the real scummy side of it 
According to sources, the two artists maintain a relationship, this super, la- super loose, boozy, casual, informal, trusting friendship, as a source put it, until Petty Bond found that La Rosa was allegedly trying to sell the works he took from the studio. At that point, the studio alerted authorities from the alleg- about the allegations, which is how the case came to directed um, to the FBI. The FBI has not responded to requests of comment. It's interesting that they went straight to the FBI and didn't talk. I wonder if they spoke to him in general, tried to pull him to one side, especially if they had a close relationship like that. Or I wonder if it was such an affront I don't know. Again, I, 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 I'm, I've not done art to this level. Obviously, I've done it in my own way, my own creativity. I don't know how I would feel if someone did this to me. Would I go straight to the police or would I go in? Because I guess if you're Raymond Pettibon, you have that level. There are people, like it's not just him in it, right? He's kind of a brand, an organization. He's a company in his own right, right? He's got employees he's working that work for him or people that he's responsible for. So maybe there's that in the back of your head or just in general, just the affront, someone coming into your home and doing that is just like too much because if they're stealing artworks, what else are they stealing? Do you know what I mean? Your mind just keeps probably going to start racing, but I wonder why they didn't just pull him to the side and speak to him directly. Maybe at that point it was already too far gone, um, but they went straight to the FBI. And of course, you know, now he, the guy's in big trouble. Another source suggested that it was an open secret that in Vienna that Rosa took on Petty Bones um, uh, from the apartment at one of Petty Bones' former girlfriends and sold to a collector in town. Jesus Christ. A different source directed me to a video of Rosa in what almost became a physical brawl with the collector. Stefan Schmitz, the opening of the AB in Los Angeles, but perhaps it was a story of another day. Really? A Petty Bones studio declined to comment beyond that one statement in New York Gallery. did. If I'm not mistaken... This Stefan Shimowitz, the kind of really prolific uh, collector guy who's kind of a, a little celebrity in his own right, wasn't he one of the people responsible for getting him his visa or something, right? And if I'm not mistaken, again, this is all like art, contemporary art gossip, but I'm pretty sure this Stefan um, Sim, 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 Simchowitz was responsible for getting Christian Rosa into the United States in some regard. So maybe that was what the fight was about. Like, I got you here, I paid, you know, I. I I paid mad amount of money. And again, these people do that because they want to be patrons of the next great art superstar. If you're responsible for getting this guy through the board, they're helping his family out, whatever it may be, you know, you're going to be part of a legendary story going forward. But also if it fails, you are then, you know, attached to somebody who was a legit fraud, a legit thief. Do you know what I mean? So I can understand why Stefan was really annoyed and he decided to fight him outside the iBid gallery in Los Angeles. But I want to see that video. I really do. But anyway, Fast forward to today, look what's happened, courtesy of the New York Times. It says here, US charges once rising artists with a selling a Raymond Pettibon forgeries. Absolutely insane. This is one of his paintings I've seen in the back. Um, you know, he's not the greatest painter in the world, but you can understand why that kind of style in like those in that year in those years like 2010, 2015 would have been so popular and why everyone was thinking that he was gonna be the guy. And again, look how he looks, handsome looking dude, dress is pretty cool. It was kind of the next great art hope in it coming forward and how far his star has fallen, man. It says yeah, in a message posted on the artist Ray and Potty Bond's Twitter account two years ago, he appeared to express his gratitude to two friends who had paid him a visit. Thank you, Christian Rosa and Henry Taylor, for coming by. Great artists and kind, genuine people, you made my day. By the time, according to federal prosecutors, Mr. Rosa was actually involved in something that was opposite of genuine. He was scheming to sell forgeries for Pettibon's work. In an incident, okay, uh, in an in indictment announced on Wednesday, Mr. Rosa was charged with wire fraud in the sale of four paintings that were purportedly Mr. Pettibon's work and that were backed by certificates of authenticity on which Rosa was accused of forging Pettibon's signature. Oh my God. A Mr. Rosa, who um, indictment says also known as Christian Rosa Weinberg, swindled buyers out of hundreds of thousands of dollars and risked of New York arts legacy um through his forgery scheme says damien williams the u.s attorney in manhattan said in statement that's true in it you don't think about that as well it damages his obviously everyone associated with him gets tainted in some way shape or form in it so i can understand why they probably went straight to the fbi in that case mr rosa 43 had been living in california but fled the united states in february and remains at large <laughs> Prosecutor said he could face up to 20 years in prison if convicted of the most serious charges against him. Reached on Thursday, the lawyer representing him on matter, Robert, uh, Robert Gottlieb, the kind of comment. So he's left the United States. I wonder where he's gone. Obviously, he's from Europe somewhere. I don't know where. Um, if he is in Europe, he's probably gone, isn't it? If they haven't found Brown Laundry by now, who's you know in some national park somewhere, chilling under a rock, probably you know. Um, dead already it's unlikely they're gonna find rosa in the middle again it's wire fraud again it's a big deal don't get me wrong but it's not exactly at the top of um i guess the police forces um you know things to get him i don't know what do you think i doubt he's gonna get found in europe in it 
Unless he gives himself up. Mr. Pettibon could not be reached for comment on Wednesday and Representative David Zuma, the gallery that represents him, did not immediately respond to comments on Thursday without commenting on the charges. The head of the operations of Mr. Pettibon Studio said via email that the artist did not write the 219 tweet. Thank you, Rosa, for the visit. Seriously, it might have been a handiwork of a hacker, perhaps, Mr. Rosa. Mr. Pettibon has a very particular style of writing, especially writing a tweet in which a very distinguished sense of humor. He would never use common adjectives like genuine or kind. <laughs> Lows. The indictment offers a following accounts of the events and charges starting in 2017 and continuing through last year Mr. Rosa worked with others to sell four pieces which he falsely presented as Mr. Pettibon's wave series I wonder if there's more series that he sold but people just not coming forward with it because part of the part of the thing with that art world right is obviously buying those great works from great artists and obviously having them in your collection having that clout being able to turn a profit in the future if you did buy one under the guise that it was a real Pettibon and now you know it's a Rosa forgery forgery sorry you don't want to really own up to it because you don't want your collection to be tainted either right it's going to damage you um the fact that you bought this underhand you know back channels and shit it's not going to look the greatest so you don't want to come forward and say anything and obviously Mr. Rosa ain't going to say nothing because he pocketed the cash right he's not going to come out and say yeah I sold him and her one you just want to keep the money you don't want people to know you know you, you want money that you have to sometimes go account unaccounted for so there's probably more out there I would imagine so it says here in 2018, Mr. Rosa enlisted the help of an undertired buyer to arrange the, oh, that buyer too, man. Oh, oh, oh. Um, to arrange the sale of the two of the four dreams to a second um, unidentified buyer. As thanks for the first buyer help, Mr. Rosa gave the person another supposed way of serious painting. Again, fakes. So he's giving them fakes. He's completing, not for fakes, well, for stuff. Is it a fake if you finish something? I wonder. If you used to go to a studio, like, you know, a production house, like, you know, a, a, a manufacturing place where they make Balenciagas and shit and then you know they've got a runway collection there but they haven't finished it whether it's kind of seams you know labeling um steaming whatever it's not been finished and then you finish it does that automatically mean it's a forgery because I think a forgery is you copying something right base base level I don't know so that 2019, Mr. Rosa exchanged emails with a friend about trying to find buyers for certain unnamed paintings. In one of the emails, Mr. Rosa wrote, they're asking about certificates, how are we getting them? At one point, Mr. Rosa's friend asked why the sales were taking so long. Mr. Rosa just responded that he wanted to find a buyer who would not resell the works at an auction. Oh, yeah, true, because then that would obviously bait up the whole thing. I'm not trying to get it busted, so that's why I'm taking longer. Mr. Rosa used the proceeds from the sale of two paintings for a down payment and mortgage payment in the house in California. <laughs> okay, that's where it gets bad because. If you're telling me he's got addiction issues, like he's a coke addict or he gambles a lot or he loves prostitutes too much, whatever, sex addict, then fair enough. Because I would imagine, like, you know, already going to your flipping mentor's house and stealing his paintings is mad to me. But then there'd be some sort of understanding if you were in really dire straits, like you owed money to the Albanian mafia or some shit. People would kind of understand your position a little bit more or you had an ex-secret family no one knew about living in the middle of flipping Botswana or something who needed really need your help or in some war-torn country in Europe or something, right? Cool. But just to do it so you can get a house in California, considering that he was on his way to be famous and rich as well, is just horrible. And also goes to show that he wasn't in it for the right reasons. Because if you're an artist coming up and you're the next great superstar, you're going to get a lot of patronage, right? You're going to get people that are willing to kind of pay for your keep, right? So basically, they're going to pay your rent in like whatever city you want to live in to do your work. They're going to fly you around. Um, you're going to get a comped life. You won't be a lot, but you'll get fully comped out, right? Someone's going to make sure you don't have to kind of work part-time in Tesco's to support your art career. But it's going to be a while before you actually see the big bucks. See, before you see the big sales. And plus, you know, the studios take a lot of money. Representatives take a lot of money. You know, by the time you actually sell a $1 million dollar painting you might only get two hundred thousand after taxes and all that shit right it's not a lot of money but still once that starts going there's only one way it's always up right in that regard especially if you keep the level of consistency high you work um consistently well and you have the right connection representation you'd be perfectly fine but it goes to show that he wasn't in it for that he was in it for the money that's why he wanted to be the next great superstar which definitely under definitely explains his style of artwork right it's very just in it's very kind of i wouldn't say trendy but there's just nothing interesting about it he's not really an amazing painter in any way shape or form it's just stylistically to just look ready for like a contemporary home somewhere right um i also wonder if maybe even with this forgery thing does that increase the value of his paintings or 
or does it diminish it? I'd say it increases it, right? The fact that he might go to prison, the fact that he's on the run, right? He's doing a take a thing at the moment. I think it actually increases the allure and the appeal that people would want him to have their works displayed in their home because it's a great conversation piece in terms of, you know, the relationship between an artist and his mentor, um, the scheming world of the art industry in the first place, the pressures that are put on the artist, blah, 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 blah. The case of forgery, which a lot of people believe is quite rampant, rampant in art but people kind of turn a blind eye to it because of the money involved i wonder if that would do anything to it but again like it's you know it's no surprise that somebody of this level was only in it for the cash because like i say i only see these sort of works as somebody who would want to make a ton of money um on the auction level or on the resale level or on the gallery level because there's you know there's nothing really interesting or that amazing about the artwork that he's creating he's not really saying anything different if anything he's just kind of you know um it's, it kind of to me it looks like an AI generated piece of artwork, especially for that time period. It just looks like something that would fit perfectly then. And, you know, again, I I don't know. Like it it, it doesn't surprise me too much that he's in this kind of passer, to be completely honest. I continued this in 2020 um, and then in by uh, after trying to help Rosa sell the other works supposedly by Petty Bomb, bought the two other forgeries as, at, at issue in the indictment. Um, the scheme began to unravel when the website Artnet published an article about allegations that Mr. Rose had forged one of the paintings sold by the first buyer, which had been placed on sale in New York auction house. Dealers who saw the images of one of the paintings being offered to the sale became suspicious when they noticed that there were seemingly strange yellow green blended into it. Normal cobalt blues, the Artnet article said, adding that the artist's signature scroll seemed to tad too polished. A day after the article was published, the indictment says Mr. Rosa emailed a friend and said, the secret is out. Less than a month later, Mr. Rosa left the United States. Um, that's a great t shirt to put. In it, the, the phrase there, the secret is out. <laughs> Less than a month later, Mr. Rosa left the United States. A few months after that, he sold the California house and tried to transfer the proceeds to sell abroad. Oh, what a dickhead. Mr. Pettibon, 64, first game, widespread attention, 1980s and 1990s, um, by making album covers such as Black Fag. The, the Minutemen and Sonic Youth, his early pieces often mixed images of baseball greats, Hollywood stars, and superheroes like the bikers and gangsters. As his career progressed, he focused more on larger works. Some of his larger paintings sold for one million or more. Mr. Rose himself was once a rising star. The market has was work peaked in 2014 when one of his paintings sold at Christie's 2009. According to Art in the article a year later, Mr. Rosa, a familiar work sold of fucking hell. Okay, that's probably why he did it then. I didn't know that. Hear that? Um, the market for his work peaked in fall 2014 when one of his paintings sold at Christie's in New York for £209,000, right? Um, and then according to Artnet article, a year later, um, a similar work by Rosa sold at Sotheby's for only thirty grand. so quickly. That kind of style of artwork, again, uninspired, um, doesn't really say much. Um, again, it's just kind of made specifically to sell. Um, then when and sold only 30 grand a year later bruv so clearly his style was diminishing in some respects so then that probably kind of married up to the scheming of the artworks because he probably was living a lifestyle of somebody that was making 200 to 500 grand per month or per year and then he had to obviously then you know kind of go down to the lowly figure of only 30 grand per month so he obviously wanted to support that lifestyle by nicking those artworks but i can't imagine anything more scummy than that to be honest you know what i mean like going to someone's home and stealing something you know and it's reselling it to buy a house is just like beyond scummy but yeah what a fall from grace for christian rosa um i doubt they'll find him um i don't think there's going to be international manhunt for him considering what he did he will probably live you know kind of keep his head down live low and probably maybe the guilt will eat him up and he'll walk into a police station and hand himself in over time but i really doubt the police are going to find him and arrest him somewhere i don't think so i think that time is already gone but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Next on the list we have... Oh, have you guys seen the trailer for Batman? That looks pretty decent, isn't it? Um, there's been a lot of talk about Robert Pattinson's Batman and about how he's going to um, play the role. I think there's a lot of conversation about it. Supposedly he didn't want to bulk up for the movie. He had these kind of other demands and COVID got into the way and kind of disrupting the filming. But from the trailer, I'm not going to play it because I don't want to get copyright strikes and shit, which is annoying. You can't play trailers on YouTube channels and shit. Um, but hey, 
if you guys listen on the podcast you'll be happy about it in any regards because you can't watch it but still it looks really good and i think if i'm not mistaken it kind of depicts um batman's early years obviously Robert person being a fairly younger dude that makes more sense um him trying to wrestle with this idea of him being a superhero um you know gotham being just completely crime ridden and dark and him having to kind of battle his own demons and it does really really look good zoe kravitz is in it too playing catwoman but from the trailer honestly i'm really impressed um his voice is you know possible but i like the idea of how they're going for a more thrillery batman it's less of a superhero this this does that it's more so a it feels like one of those kind of um dark noir type thrillers right kind of scandinavian sort of influence in some way shape or form of course it's still got great action scenes by the looks of it but i just love how they're going for that approach vis-a-vis -vis anything else is an article from The Verge says the latest trailer for the Batman sees Robert Pattinson Dark Knight face off against the Riddler. It says uh, Batman, Batman, uh, the Batman sorry debuted a brand new trailer at the DC fandom on Saturday, showing off the best look yet at Robert Pattinson's take on the Dark Knight and promising an even darker, grittier version of the Gotham's caped crusader than any other hit film before. Set just a few years before, just set a few years in Batman's career as a superhero, the Batman promises to show not just a look at the early years of Batman, but numerous other proto villains and allies including Zary Kravitz as Catwoman, Jeffrey Wright, as from the Westworld, right, as James Gordon, Andy Serkis as Alfred, and Colin Farrell as Penguin, which is an interesting choice to be as Penguin, isn't it? But hey, he's probably a bit too handsome for that role. Um, a, new tailor, a new trailer, sorry, also gives the first look at Paul Dano's take on the iconic Batman villain, the Riddler, who appears to be going for a far creepier serial killer s style version of the character, as opposed to the campier trickster that most Riddler adaptions um, hew towards. They're what's black and blue and dead all over, we hear him ask an opening shot of the trailer shows a man who we see only from behind sitting in a diner counter drinking a cup of coffee when the cops arrive he puts his hands up they slam him on the counter cuff him and he's taken away we see the unmistakable sign of the riddler in the firm of the latte he leaves behind a question mark the latest trailer gives a much different vibe of the previous iterations of the batman saga it balances light and dark in a way that gives it almost film and noir effects here i told you before we don't learn a lot about the characters but we definitely get a sense that this younger batman hasn't quite quite identified as a hero just yet take the way he describes a bat signal fear is a tool when that light hits the sky it's not a call it's a warning yeah that that trailer beginning that was so good when you hear him it's a warning Patterson and co-stars a crevice who plays mysterious selena kyle catwoman were joined by director matt reason and panel discussion before the trailer dropped Patterson said the version of the cape crusader really knows what he's doing um, when he puts on the cow, it's a bit out of control. He hasn't really def defined what Batman is. He's becoming this sort of odd creature. The original trailer of the movie released a year, a year ago in 2020 fan event, only for the mere glimpse of the movie based on the small amount of footage that Reese had been able to film before COVID. It's a long road for the theaters of Batman, where the film originally tended to hit theaters in June 21st, but it's been pushed to the 1st of October. It's now slated to open in theaters March 2022. So a long time to go, but I'm really interested to see this iteration of the Batman. Obviously, the, the you know, the dark night series from what's his name um what's that guy's name flipping uh dark knight what's his name what's his name <laughs> baby one second dark knight trilogy yeah who's who directed that again because that that was really i watched that recently actually who directed that uh christopher nolan that series was actually you know incredible as a trilogy it was really good obviously maybe dark knight rises probably takes the biscuit in terms of overall um which one is the best of them i would say or maybe the dark knight uh batman begins was all right i thought maybe the, the, yeah maybe dark knight and maybe dark knight rises were probably the best two of that trilogy but still overall as a trilogy just superb all around let's not deny that right let's not deny that but i'm interested to see a different adaptation of it of batman especially the earlier years i think that's going to be good especially the wrestling of consciousness and what he kind of represents and um, the anger the rage of his family dying right the fact that he's just this lonely rich kid um you know just trying to figure out life that's a real good way to go about things i'm really interested man i'm really curious to see when that eventually does drop and we get to see that in the cinemas itself i cannot wait to watch that i'm not gonna lie i cannot wait to watch that what else do we have here um oh we have this um 
this interesting story is close to the New York Times. Uh, rate again, I don't know nothing about football. I don't know nothing about American football. I have no very little about American sports, so bear with me. It says here, Raiders coach resigns after homophobic and misogynist emails, right? This was all the talk on my timeline over the last, what, week or whatever it may be. Um, allegedly, this guy's emails were leaked and he had some very disparaging things to say about certain people um, within, you know, the American football um, sports landscape, other teams, other players, um, commentators, you know, the league officials what's that guy's name again um, that everyone hates um, I don't know what his name is the name escapes me but anyway he didn't have some kind of things to say about the guy and put, the pressure got put on him and eventually then he had to retire so he had to resign from his role as coach um says that John Gruden stepped down on Monday as a coach of the Los Angeles Raiders, sorry, Los Angeles, Las Vegas Ra uh, Raiders um, uh, team hours after the New York Times detailed emails in which he had made homophobic misogyny remarks following an early report of racist statements about a union leader, right? Um, let's actually open that another window. Um, his resignation was a striking departure from the football from the football league for a coach who had won the Super Bowl, been a market analyst at ESPN and returned to the NFL in 2018 to leave a surgeon Raiders. The, the day said I resigned, they said, coach, I love the Raiders, I don't want to be a distraction. Mark Davis, the owner of the Raiders, said in a statement that he accepted the resignation. Um, Gruden's departure came after New York Times report that the NFL officials, as part of a separate workplace misconduct investigation that did not directly involve him, found that Gruden had casually and frequently unleashed misogynistic, homophobic um, language. Uh, oh, what am I do? Oh, I've got to reset this again in that call. It's, it's freezing on me. Bear with me. Ba, 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 ba. Refresh this, refresh this. Come on, come on, don't die. Cool, there we go. Um, da, 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 da. In a statement, he announced it merges. Oh, yeah, this is it, yeah. Guru's departure came out New York Times detail. The da, 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 misogynistic homophobic language over several years of denigrate to denigrate people around the game and to mock some of the league's me <laughs> momentous changes. He denounced the emergence of women as referees and drafting of a gay player and tolerance of players protesting during the playing of national anthem according um, to review emails reviewed by the Times. Should we be surprised by this? Not really. From how um, what's his face was treated, um, who's the guy that was dealing with the new Colin Kaepernick, right? We should have known that there was definitely people within the NFL organization, within the team structure and why not, who had some very differing ways of how they looked at protesting, how they looked at the modernization of the game. It was fairly obvious that these people kind of had these sort of opinions. So these emails shouldn't be that much of a surprise, right? With what's said in behind kind of, what's said in kind of private. And that's the issue that I have with this sort of stuff. I don't really know why his email specifically were leaked why he was targeted maybe because he won the super bowl maybe because he was a coach of the raiders who are known to be a little bit controversial in their own right um i'm not too sure why they picked at him because i'm pretty certain a lot of those nfl coaches are probably you know completely nuking their inboxes and making sure they're getting rid of any evidence that they have because they probably say some flagrant stuff in the emails when they're talking to other coaches or people in the game i'm fairly certain of it and i'm not really a fan of people's private i'm not really a fan of people policing how others act in private that's the whole point the whole point of being a decent human being i think Obviously, it's beneficial if you could be the same way in private that you are in public or same way in public you're in private. But sometimes you might be a little bit more loose, especially around your friends, people that you actually know, your family, than you would be around strangers. And maybe you act a little bit more reserved. You're a little bit more respectful. You're a little bit more humane or whatever it may be in front of people that you don't know. That is completely okay. So why should you be judged on the stuff that you do privately when it's none of any it's none of anyone's business, right? Especially when they leak the emails, especially when again, it's maybe don't get me wrong, he's saying insulting things, cool. He's saying really rude things, really crass things, but he's not planning um to murder people, right? He's not kind of plotting the abduction of children or whatnot. He's just saying some really mean stuff over emails. Should that be enough? Again, private emails too, should that be enough to someone to lose their job, lose their entire career? I'm not too sure about it. He made some really crass crazy remark about one of the analysts i think a black guy basically described his lips like tires or some shit right clearly the guy is a piece of shit we know that right we absolutely know that and it's kind of again ironic that you would describe a black analyst or somebody like that in the media like that knowing that you've got loads of black players in your own team you probably would never say those things to their face because you know they'd probably crack your head open in a changing room so obviously the guy's a coward in that respect but i don't know how i feel about people 
getting sacked or getting fired from their jobs for stuff that they're saying in private unless he was saying this stuff on um nfl server or something right and they you are going to say no we had a duty of care to not to have these kind of messages being you know exchanged on our servers and our platform and whatnot i don't really know but it's just interesting that they picked him as a full guy maybe it's a sign it's a message to the other dude to the investigating to kind of get their act together and try and take out somebody as big as him who's obviously won the super bowl is a, is a good little feather in someone's cap i'm not too sure but again i'm not so comfortable with people getting fired for saying stuff in private i'm really really not i think if you go out and say some stupid stuff in public especially somebody when you with notoriety and fame um in your industry that you're in you deserve all the consequences i'm a big believer in in like letting people say exactly what they want but i'm also believer in the consequences coming thick and fast of whatever you say i don't think we should live in a world people are scared to say the words that they want to say or the thing or the views that they want to share but you also have to be prepared for the consequences whether that's you getting cancelled whether that's sponsors walking away from you you have to be prepared for it but i think too much people are more worried about just not saying the thing in the first place obviously because you know they have rent to pay they have a family to look after so i definitely understand that way of doing things but i think people should be allowed to say the bad thing you should be able to spot who the bad person is by let them say the bad thing and then everyone should be able to make a decision as whether or not they want to support the person um walk away uh chastise them you know argue them whatever that's how it should be in the world i think but you know unfortunately we're in this weird world at the moment where you can't even share your thoughts even in private and then when you do share your thoughts you immediately get fired for them it's like i don't know um gruden's messages were sent out were sent to bruce allen the former president of the washington football team and others while he was working at espn as a color analyst during the monday night football in the emails gruden called the league's commissioner roger goodell a faggot <laughs> and a useless anti-football pussy and said that goodell should not have pressured jeff fisher then the coach of the rams to draft queers as a reference to michael sam a gay player chosen by a team in 20, 2014 now come on do you really surprised that somebody in the nfl a coach even other players aren't saying these kind of things come on are we being for real do we think these things aren't being said or do we think they've all kind of they're all very progressive i don't think so if anything i think the nfl for whatever reason seems to have the most I won't say normal working cup, but they kind of share very middle America kind of opinions about the world and stuff. They're not as kind of forward thinking as some of the coastal areas of the United States. I get the feeling of a lot of football players, maybe because they come from humble origins, working class families. I'm not too sure. Some, some, some of them I'm sure are rich, but they're very kind of conservative, quote unquote, in their views. So it's no surprise that they would be a little bit res resistant, resistant to the whole kind of left leaning push that exists now in the NFL with all the big you know lgbt flag before games um you know the attention to all these kind of social issues and da -de da 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 modernizing it with different referees from different backgrounds races sexual orientations it's no surprise that it would be because i don't know maybe it's just i get the feeling nfl is way more conservative than basketball especially the players that are playing they have some very like you know there's there's whole teams rosters of nfl players that haven't got the vaccine right and they're not going to get it you know i mean they're kind of making a stand that way very quietly in that respect so um i don't know man i don't know in numerous emails um, during the seven year period during the early the ending of 2018 Gruden criticized Goodell and the league for trying to reduce concussions and said Eric Reed a player who had demonstrated during the playing of the national anthem should be fired in reference to Gruden using homophobic slur to refer to Goodell and offensive language to describe from NFL owners and coaches the journalists who cover the league Gruden added NFL and Raiders did not respond for comment oh yeah well, let's say that this is the racist comment that he made and he makes called someone lips like tires or some shit what do you say about the guy um, again, always saying I'm not kind of I'm not flipping co saying anything the guy's saying is clearly a piece of shit, but I don't know, man. What's it? I'm um, including the coach to the dumb. Um, who's black and face opposition the email surfaced just hours before the player tentatively referred to team vote to give smith a fifth team the union da, 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 da. there's reason to believe that the league's owners prefer to stay what did he say come on where is it oh i'll go exit them again what's wrong with this thing why does it keep fucking flopping on me wait one second let me reload this again he called these lips like ties or something is that what i said what i read there let's see if i can see it did they write Dubris Smith. Yeah, that's again. The email written in 2011 in exchange between Gruden, who's white and an analyst on ESPN at the time, and Bruce Allen, who was then the president of the former of the Washington football team, said, um, 
Dumbos Dumbose Smith has lips the size of Michelin tires. <laughs> Demons this guy during the review of a workplace misconduct. Um oh shit, that's why. Mad. The emails were discovered during a review of workplace misconduct at the Washington football team that ended this summer. During the past few months, the NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell, the told executives he to look at more than six hundred and fifty thousand emails. Um uh, including the one that included Goodell's com Gruden's comment that week, the executive presented a summary of the review, and Goodell shared with him the Raiders' emails pertaining to Gruden. So they're investigating another team, and then his emails popped up. Like, who the hell is calling somebody's lips like tires? The email from John Gruden denigrating um, the Morris, uh, the Morris Smith, is appalling, abhorrent, and wholly contradictory for values. What does that say? Oh, that's, that's okay. So it's a pun on his name, right? Dumb Boris. Well, his name is Dan Morris. Okay, I guess, you know, again, lame insults, isn't it? Racist people have the worst insults when it comes to denigrating somebody based on the colour of their skin, and it? It's just a little bit lame, isn't it? All right, cool, mate. Uh, what it says here? Uh, da, da, da. Um, Gruden also criticised President Barack Obama during his election campaign 2012, as well as then Vice President Joseph Biden, whom Gruden called a nervous, clueless pussy. <laughs> he used words similar to describe Gruden and Dumas Smith, Executive Director of the NFL Pet Association. The league is already investigating Gruden as well. Another email he wrote in Ellen, um, racist terms to describe Smith, who is black, in that email. He, um, da, da, da. We said that the league is already investigating Gruden as well. Another email, take together the email, provide an unvarnished look at the chubby, so a clubby culture of one NFL circle of peers where white male decision makers felt comfortable showing pornographic me 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 images deriding the league's policies and what's that word called and joe curally showing homophobic language <clears throat> come on guys again i ended there but do people really think this is the only person that does this sort of stuff or says these sort of things behind closed doors especially in the quote-unquote locker room what do you think people are saying like really do you think the black players aren't saying some very um derogatory things about their other teammates or people from other cultures and backgrounds that's just part of sports unfortunately especially those kind of um that level of sports especially with those kind of egos are involved and again considering that there's parts of america where people have the views that this coach has it's no surprise that a player a coach of his level would also have those views in his own kind of private email that he's having back to back at people again should you be calling people tire lips on a flipping nfl server probably not that probably explains why he's getting why he had to you know resign and how much of an idiot he is to kind of say those kind of things out on a workplace email it's just really insane but again am i a fan of people getting counter for what they say in private probably not um but unfortunately this is the world we live in at the moment and i think you just have to be smarter about your hate and about your um about your racism right you kind of have to be smarter about it you can't go around you know um shouting or making monkey noises at black people while they're walking by because you're going to get either killed or you're going to get head caved in but maybe a smart way to go about things to put yourself in power and deny people <clears throat> from my community a chance to you know buy housing in a certain sort of area and then you kind of want a small kind of moral victory in that regard but in terms of saying this sort of stuff out loud we're just not living in that world anymore people are just not going to accept it private or not you're just never going to be able to survive in this world having those kind of views because um society is basically without without me without i think much success because i think as much as we've progressed um in terms of our acceptance of people's way of life and backgrounds and stuff i still think this poor this kind of kick dragging us kicking and screaming into modernity has maybe made more people double down on their hate double down on their homophobia double down on their racism double down on, the, on their flipping xenophobia um because they're not exactly being cajoled or convinced into coming into the modern era they're being dragged kicking and screaming and of course i think when you do that to people they resist you know um automatically gonna resist and be like no 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 i know i know i know how these people are these people these people your people those kind of fucking um racist dog whistling languages are going to be used and it's no surprise that again it's it's crazy to think that um a guy who's coaching the raiders a team that is basically ingrained in black culture i think in some sort of some some way or shape or form especially minorities in some way or shape or form black and brown people is somebody that shared these kind of views but again i'm not surprised i really really am not i've heard some crazy shit being said in locker rooms and stuff by people especially at my lowly level so i can only imagine what people are saying at that kind of high level behind closed doors but yeah he'll be fine and he'll figure it out he'll probably end up going to some um conservative sports channel and just doing his kind of spiel and analysis on there because he probably still a draw for those kind of people then these people always land on their feet so i'm pretty sure he'll figure it out and if he doesn't 
oh well um what else we got here oh yeah we got this courtesy of what is it the daily mail is the daily mail yeah daily mail and uh, we've got this amazing article here portrait of a tough guy and again this is maybe daily mail just being inflammatory Portrait of a tough guy, Conor McGregor is flanked by four bodyguards, including one who carries his alcohol spritz for him as he holds in Rome with his fiance D. Devlin, right? Conor looks fucking amazing, right? This is him walking through the streets of Rome, kind of owning that sector with obviously three massive flipping bodyguards who all look like they can fight, right? They all look like they can fight or grapple. They don't look like the bodyguard you'd find outside a sketch or something, right? They look like they can actually handle themselves. But the headline is quite misleading because it says here, portrait of a tough guy which basically insinuates that connor isn't really tough and um, because he needs so much security to walk around the streets of rome it, when in all actuality considering um connor's recent um outburst in social media in public and just to generally how he's been carrying himself the last few years it's actually more so to protect um him from others because they know how he can get they know how agitated and irritated he can get they know how self-destructive he can be too he's got that He's got that John John Jones button right somewhere in him that he can press and just kind of go completely hell for leather. So those security guards are not there to protect him. They're there to protect himself from the fans, right? More so. Um, it's not an actual, oh, we're going to stop threats coming in because, you know, it's Conor McGregor, right? He can basically beat up most people in the world, right? Um, uh, you know, of course, when you don't factor in size and kind of weapons and all that shit. But it's more so to protect Conor from the crowd and from the public to say, especially somebody walks up to him and it's a Khabib fan and says Hamdulillah or something. I don't know. You know what I mean? You don't want him to go flipping ape shit. So that's the reason why I do it, especially when he's out with his missus. It just doesn't make any sense. But these security guards are absolute units, and with the exception of this guy, right, who probably is the most dangerous one here, but they're all absolute units. Like, especially this guy at the back, he legitimately looks like an extra in a movie or something. Look at him. Fucking hell. And they're all dressed in a nice suit and boot. I'm sure he put them in his suits that he designs or something along those kind of lines. But yeah. I wonder where you find these people. I'm sure there's a service you use, right? It's just hire people, security guards, there's ilk, and they put down their stats and shit, you know? And you've got to be a certain size, you've got to be a certain build. Crazy. And then walking through the streets of Rome, looking, look at the crowd he commands, man. Like, he's a real superstar, isn't it? And this is why you know you're a superstar, because he's lost, well, he hasn't won a fight in years, isn't it, right? And he's still commanding this level of attention. That's when you know you're a real superstar. That's when you know people really give a fuck about you. And that's how you know you've kind of transcended your sport. Where you can still kind of garner this sort of reaction and crowd response from people. Especially in a country that you wouldn't necessarily say people... You wouldn't think people would know Connor that well in Italy. Do you know what I mean? But, you know, look at look at where she's looking at. Like an absolute snack. <laughs> and he's carrying his drink from here at the front. Apple spritz. That that's the life, isn't it? I love that kind of life for celebrities or people of that kind of ilk where you go into a shop and you just pick up you pick up your glass and you just walk out. You don't even ask if you can take it. You just walk and take it with you. No kind of request made. Do you know what I mean? You just keep it moving and they're actually honored that you'll take one of their glasses with them. They don't actually complain. Whereas people like myself, back in the day you'd kind of sneak a pint glass into a bag and hope you can take that home with you, right? Um but yeah. It's massive. Look at keeping all the crowds away, a crowd, keep a circle around him someone here recording it looks like i guess recording evidence just in case something happens so if 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 somebody does something stupid they've got their angle that they can obviously share in terms of putting it from a lawsuit he's doing that thing that people do when they're hench they always kind of lift up their shirt touch their belly so you can see their flat stomach and shit but he looks like a unit in it he looks like he's been he, he's been on the he's been on the pounded yam he looks fucking wham bruv wide as hell look at him jesus christ He's got a ridiculously big head, isn't it? You don't really notice it in the ring. But for somebody so short and small, he's got a really big head. Maybe that's why he's probably made for fighting, isn't it? Like this this corner, this kind of triangle of his head and his neck, is kind of really stamped in, isn't it? Not a lot of room or wiggle room that goes on around there. But yeah, look at the fans, man. Absolutely crazy. Oh yeah, oh, this is Instagram account they're posting on there. Insane, bruv. Insane. But yeah, big up Connor. Um, out there in Rome living a life of luxury lips and the missus on the back of a cab you know how it is isn't it you know the vibes you know the vibes um, what else we talk about here 
Oh yeah, let's talk about this quickly before we end. News courtesy of Vulture. Um, Rory and Mal have moved on. No, really. So, as most of you are aware, I'm a, I was a big fan of the Joe Budden podcast. Um, I thought their original lineup of Rory, or not original, but you know the the most famous lineup of Rory, Mal, and Joe Budden were maybe one of the best podcasts to have ever been created in the history of time. I think for the jokes they provided, for the kind of perspective on kind of this thing of ours called culture in terms of hip-hop in terms of music industry business stuff relationship stuff which again i wasn't that big of a fan of but still their whole appeal um the album reviews the jokes and all that stuff was really good especially in terms of it being like men all going through different stages of their career different stages of their personal relationship to see them all grow together the bonds the jokes the fallings out it was really cool especially for somebody like myself who enjoys having these sort of weird parasocial relationships with people from afar especially when you interview the podcast it was really good to see them kind of evolve and progress over time and especially in Joe Budden's case him being a very kind of problematic sort of figure in the culture to see him finally coming good and maybe rewriting the narrative of himself and becoming successful um, with his friends was like a perfect entourage story right it was seeing in real life then when it kind of all kind of decimated when then when it kind of all fell apart and we saw that at the center of it the villain again was Joe and everything that we've heard about Joe Budden throughout the years from his past relationships to his business deals to just how he's kind of viewed in the industry that it was no fluke that he did the same thing they did to others to his best friends but for whatever reason us fans thought he would never do that he did he ends up firing them or they end up falling out I don't know how the you know the sequence of events goes really it depends who you speak to in terms of did they get fired or did they leave because at that time they were kind of on strike again and then by that time Joe did that whole famous podcast where he had all the MTC sound and was speaking um, to Rory and Mo in a very kind of derogatory manner especially when you consider their friends and I guess the business just got in the way and they kind of all broke up then Rory and Mo sort of started their own podcast which again wasn't the best but still was nice to hear them hear them speak you know share their views and opinions um i still think the dynamic between the two is a bit stiff rory of uh, sorry mo of course is more reserved he's not the most outgoing and kind of freely giving up of information kind of guy but i think slowly but surely he's kind of getting there and i think rory's kind of really carrying the show with his kind of comedic chops and just generally kind of self-effacing sort of view and humor that he has and then over time it's obviously i think slowly but surely improved especially with the skits that they're doing they're, they're filming um you can tell they've, they've really got comedic chops between the both of them in terms of putting bits together and the acting is fairly decent too um and then overnight it feels like if you know i think how many shows they've done i think it's like 16 or something they've kind of done a proof of concept being able to show that they've got the views they've got the numbers they've got the attention they've been able to then kind of translate that into a deal they've got a podcast deal. so the same two people who joe was kind of admonishing on his podcast and saying that they didn't bring nothing to the table he's been trying to push them to do their own shows they're lazy basically that's what he's saying it they're lazy they're entitled um have, have now basically gone and secured a multi-million dollar deal um despite not having joe who says he's the best at business and when it comes to this kind of thing which is flipping crazy so it says here the implosion of the Joe and podcast happened gradually and then all of a sudden the talk um, the talk cast hosted by Budden the former rapper turned media personality along with Rory Farrell and Jamal Mar Clay had been a increasingly prominent concern among hip hop circles since its launch in 2014 from the delivery of what the Vultures on Craig Jenkins described as a kind of people's history in the modern hip hop industry at its height the show achieved a level of fame to point the way the New York Times regarded Budden as a Howard Stern of hip hop and the production also had the distinction of being Spotify's very first exclusive deal originally signed in 2018 that they'll exceedingly consequently have been apparently so effective for, Spir for, for Spotify that CEO Daniel Elk would later remark we should do 1,000 of these which the company eventually did reshaping the podcast as a result but, uh, but all that came to a halt back in the summer when Budden announced he had fired Farrell and Clay who had been casting a show from near on the beginning because of a dispute over finances in the way used in in the way things tend to be when two parties are intertwined with grievances what specifically actually it remains a source of some contention from the outside the story appears in bits and pieces a mess of disputes over accounting profits and value respect there was a piece of leaked audio where Budden berated the co-host for not sufficiently contributing to the show despite asking for more in a public rebuttal Clay and Farrell painted a convincing picture of a titular host reaching the apophysis of a long simmering power trip the whole thing seemed to boil down to the fundamental conflict of a power dynamics and the line that separates the makes a creative partner and employee and a friend 
All of this was, of course, already taking place in the wake of another prominent scuffle, the one between Budden and Spotify, which resulted in the Budden refusing the contract extension and blowing up his relationship with the Swedish streaming service. He accused the company of undervaluing the show despite the benefits of bringing to the table, and now he could uh, make a compelling case that he's done the same with Carol Farrell and Clay. Cued to the present, and both parties have long gone their separate ways. Budden continues to show that the show is no longer val- available on Spotify. Meanwhile, Clay and Farrell independently launched their own podcast, New Rory and Mo, back in July, which has been publishing shows weekly today the former um, co-hosts are making an announcement that they have signed a serious stitcher deal the show will now be premiered or released through signed view stitcher and the show will now let's say sorry let me read that again they have signed a serious xm stitcher the show will now be released through the stitcher new more label the first episode is under the new um, arrangement scheduled to drop in November 2nd with the new installments every Tuesday and Thursday. Vodra caught up with the duo recently to talk about the deal and what they're hoping for the show so again crazy in it to think that the, the two people that everyone was denigrating and saying they wouldn't be able to do on their own did it on their own i have to be honest after the first episode few episodes of the new show i didn't know i didn't think they could do it either they've proved me wrong in that regard so big up them in that extent um and obviously they've proved wrong for being um dj academics it says yeah i'm a little bit confused sorry I, um what's the question say i'll admit to being a little confused over the specifics of everything that happened last year okay so what did Roy Kamal say straight away yeah and no it's not an issue for us that's something you would probably i have to ask him but it would be very funny a lot of would a lot of it would be exposed if he decided to do that that's not a route he would want to go i can assure you that said rory uh Got it. Um, let's start here. Where's the backstory behind the deal with Stitcher? Roy says, I mean, Stitcher made the most sense out of the whole group. Outside of them, we met with almost everybody and we met with a lot of people who were just trying to get their footing in the podcasting world, which wouldn't have been a great partnership. With a lot of our outlets, it felt like we were going to push them to the next level, not the other way around. With Stitcher, Mal says, the people here, Jasmine in particular, she's very passionate about the show and the things that they have in mind. It just made sense to everything we're about. Um, there were other offers and more money on the table, but we didn't allow what we're trying to do we just didn't feel the same connection with those people that's really an important part i remember when i was working in marketing and i had the opportunity to sign again it's funny the people that i flipping gave deals to and signed who didn't do anything for me going forward but hey we move we move but one of the reasons why I was able to kind of carry a lot of those deals and or look at the way I was, the way I was able to kind of seal a lot of those deals and get those conversations even started was because I was generally a fan. I came at it with a passion. I came at it with the knowledge of these people and what they did. And maybe the deal for them was lame and corny. But because I was somebody that's passionate and wanted to take part, I wanted to kind of um, help them in terms of boosting their image, in terms of giving them more money, whatever it may be, they were willing to do that deal. Um, and a lot of it does come down to that. Like, who do I like? Best? Especially if when you're kind of pitching things and you're you know amongst other people who are pitching sometimes it just comes down to whether or not they like you more or not whether or not you actually get what they're doing so that's definitely a feather in the cap of jasmine henley brown the more senior executive producer well done good job what were the priorities in close in these conversations Rory says we definitely wanted to add some new elements to podcasting I feel like podcasting has become pretty stagnant and little oversaturated where everyone is just sitting up microphones and talking like I am about the same thing every single day it's become like the new mixtape and the new merch line it's just this shit that everybody keeps doing after everything that's happened with the podcast Ma and I sat down and we were like yo I think we, the only way we can continue doing this is if the, we, we do it in a really unique way so that's what we, the big, so that's what is big in this conversation we wanted to add different sketch elements in it different types of interviews different types of people that would be on these podcasts our fan bases are really gravitated towards the sketch stuff and the other things we've been adding there's a live show stuff too though obviously with the elephant in the room being covid we're taking our time with it but as far as um, really bringing live shows together that's going to come in 2022 things are going a little calmer i can't wait for that that's gonna be awesome did you ever consider staying independent the royce is definitely just knowing the past experience that ma and i've had with podcasts and being independent was obviously something that would make sense but there are ways to there are ways for corporations and creators to work together people have spent so much time making status quo where the creators get fucked over and there's just so much easier ways to cooperate and creators to work together luckily to cheers one of those same pages for us i agree man i think there's too much bad kind of smoke put on or stains put on 
flipping corporations when it comes to working with creators i think if you have the right kind of goals um and you seem to align with the company you work with you should be fine and usually i think if you're using it mostly as a opportunity to get funding and to also kind of free marketing and advertising then you are going to be okay um especially if you kind of have a clear vision of what you're trying to do and of course maybe having in the back of your head that there is uh, an exit strategy or there is the possibility that the show could just get absorbed by the company and taken over is also something to kind of bear in mind maybe you say to yourself hey i'm gonna have a good two-year run and kind of bounce or whatever it may be fine but i think overall um corporations can really add a lot to a creative's kind of creative output in that respect right in terms of you being able to do more access better guests use better equipment like it's just another level what you can do with those kind of dudes and guys and when it comes to those kind of things um Moss said we're not against going independent sure we signed a deal but again it makes sense to understand what we're trying to do I think the whole world saw that Mao and I stood for and where our heads were as far as what we were going to tolerate and not tolerate we were not going to just do a deal to just do a deal we publicly turned out more money than most podcasts would ever dream to see so we're not going to do something else a deal is fair okay fair enough and supposedly allegedly according to the rumours on the, in the interwebs because people like to leak these news to make people know Wagwan they signed a 10 million dollar deal and they still get to keep the, the the ip of the podcast in so basically it's like a you know an overinflated licensing deal but obviously for the podcast and platforms it still works for them because they can still make a bunch of money off the ads to make that back in a heartbeat especially with the fans that they have rory and mal but they've signed a 10 million dollar deal like absolutely wild especially you consider how again how much joe kind of spoke about how bad they were at business and they didn't bring nothing to the table for two guys who were basically looked at as stooges according to academics who turn around and secure a 10 million dollar deal shows that maybe people counted them out incorrectly and they maybe are a lot smarter than what they kind of appear to be just to confirm both of you continued your own show so yeah absolutely i'm saying was it do a spotify ever on the table i mean with both spotify it wasn't a bad conversation by any means it just didn't make sense for us at the time in one of the first new warrior more one thing you mentioned was that you're hoping to do things that weren't able to do an old show could you talk about that a lot of things wanting to do in the old show that we weren't able to because uh we lacked control looking back um that was the beginning of the end honestly all that started when every time we wanted to try something the energy around the we, we just oh, i don't know despite the fact that this was our show our what do you mean oh d despite the fact that it was our show you know what i mean and then there are lots of other business meetings that are happening that we didn't know about coming out of all this is a blessing because now it's all literally just rory and myself having conversations about what we creatively want to do stuff that we want to do, do, do so yeah that that's the good thing about doing bad business when you do bad business your bare minimum for good business is just to talk openly and to be like hey this is the money everything that comes in we split 50 50 after expense or whatever da, da, da. you're just clear that's the benefit i think the problem is sometimes people are so used to bad business they don't know what good business looks like so you just keep repeating the same mistakes but i think if you can if you can see what went wrong prior and you just have a base level of requirements of like hey just communicate with me if you're not happy with what's happening here let's talk let's maybe leave certain conversations for the podcast i don't know whatever rules you put in place to ensure that you have a healthy relationship a business relationship and friendship you can do off the back of those kind of things so that's where the blessing comes in did that happen with Joe? Says so, yeah, I'm excited for the creative um, agenda of the show. To be able to push the show forward rather than push the particular person forward. There's so much we can do when egos are stripped. When our actual focus is it's not personality, it's a show, and that's what I'm excited for. Oh, shots there, isn't it? Shots there. I'm excited that the creative agenda for this show will be able to push the show forward rather than push a particular person forward. There's so much we can do when egos are stripped. When our actual focus is the person, not a personality, it's a show. That's what I'm excited for. That obviously was a shy Joe and definitely a reflection what we've seen saying on the sub, on the Joe Biden podcast subs, um, which I'm obviously a part of. A lot of people said that the kind of the downward spiral of the show maybe ha probably had a, had started, but we didn't know what's going on behind the scenes. But an early indication might have been when Joe Biden changed the name of um the podcast to from the our name is podcast layer which is probably one of the best tiles for a podcast and he changed it then to the joe button show in it right whether it's called now joe button podcast um and obviously at the time it was a he said it was a branding thing wanted to bring everything under one umbrella to increase their ability to get deals but really if anything it was a 
you know, kind of as a, it was him sort of reasserting his dominance that it was his show and those guys were his co host It wasn't like an an equal playing field in that regard. He didn't want to share the wealth. He didn't want to share the notoriety. It was just like all the attention had to be kind of directed towards Joe in that respect. And, you know, eventually that kind of led to, you know, them falling out as people. And I think that's the issue that I've always had with it. I think for whatever reason, Joe just didn't really respect or recognize the uh, what the other people brought to the show even people like parks where everyone hates now right those kind of voices together was what made that show magic but for some reason he generally did think that he was the star of the show and people only came to hear him don't get me wrong some people most people did come to hear what he had to say but the way that show was so good was because they all basically took the piss out of each other on i mean it reminded you of you and your own friends or people that you'd like to be friends with right um and for whatever reason, he didn't recognize that. I don't know why. It's just strange when you think of the success of the show and it's quite clear that them as a group was the reason why people loved them. But I guess people's egos. And maybe it's because of his lack of success in the music industry. He finally got some notoriety with podcasting and maybe he was, he was really weird wanting it to be true that he finally got the love and adoration that he thinks he deserves as a personality, especially with all those other shows he was doing. It's no surprise he was gassing himself up. He had that show on Revolt. He had the other show he was doing, interviewing guests and shit, right, the pull-up. It's no surprise that he thought he was the star of the show in that regard. Um, let's project forward a bit. What do you think the show will be like in 12 months? Hard to say. I think we'll just be in a place where we collect as much credit data as possible. We're excited to try new things. It's the style of interview. We don't want to just sit down, group people. Da, 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 da. But yeah, good interview. Um, excited for them lot. They spoke to him. I ran into him, but it wasn't really a conversation. I haven't seen or spoken to him since my last day at the studio. I'm happy it went that way because I had seen him or ran into him. It would have been bad news. Oof. Jesus Christ it's still tens of, that's the thing as well you have to give Mo credit for again Mo deserves a lot of credit for this because from what I remember of the fallout Mo didn't really have that much of an issue with the situation he was more so standing up for Rory because Joe told Rory to take a break because he felt like his attitude was bad and um, he wasn't bringing up into the show and maybe it was a bit too tense maybe the conversations around the accounting were getting in the way of their relationship on the show right so Joe took the decision to basically tell Rory to take a time out. And basically, Mo was like, nah, why are you telling him to take a time out? You're in a position to tell him to take a time out. This is our show. If he has to take a time out, you discuss it together as a team, as a group of people. And then that's when Joe reminded everybody, no, this is my show. You guys are my employees. And then I think the famous line about, um, what do you say? Um, the podcast business is none of your business or something like that, right? Whatever, something along those kind of lines. But in general, Ma basically went on strike with Rory, like as in support, more so as I have an issue with Joe as bad as yours. He just did it like, no, 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 he can't, if, if, if you're on strike, I'm on strike kind of thing. And look what's happening at the end of it. Him standing on these principles and having some sort of morals and backbone and whatever has gone on to reward them in his way. And I think especially in this world at the moment, especially with people like DJ Academic promoting the likes of, you know, 6 9 and whatnot, it can be sometimes, or even just these kind of channels where they talk to these bird-brained girls, you can get the idea that sometimes the people winning are the ones that don't have the morals, don't have the principles. They're the ones that get forward in life the most. But really and truly, if you're a good, decent person, usually um, you do get your just deserves in the end. Usually. Again, it sometimes does happen where, you know, the nice guy finishes last. But again, this is not a nice guy thing. This is just more so doing the right thing because they were friends. That's the thing that's really disappointing about this. This bad business happens all the time when people are not friends or just colleagues. It happens, cool. You kind of sweep under the rug. But when you're actually friends, you think you're owed a kind of a level I won't say respect but just like maybe it is just respect you're owed something that would mean that maybe it wouldn't go as far as him saying those insulting things to the get to, to him Rory and Marl whatever Joe's case maybe it wouldn't go as far as them kind of you know not speaking forever it, there'll be a there'll be a thing there'll be a line that you draw when you're friends maybe we're not friends you kind of step over it you know to get on someone's nerves but there's something that you do when you're friends where you just want to make sure that the person that you actually love as a friend isn't hurt it doesn't feel disrespected right all that kind of doesn't have to call in question your friendship in general that maybe is a way to go about things probably but again you know that wasn't going to happen but you know again larger to more um you know he did in the end up get rewarded for standing up for his co-host and friend and now they're both multi-millionaires on the way to probably make more millions and if they just keep doing what they're doing not improving in the slightest they're going to be richer than rich but i'm sure they're going to improve it you know what i mean especially when they add in live shows the money and the opportunity to do interesting things is going to be incredible especially with their connections and links so it's only on the upwards and i think as a joe budden 
you have to maybe look at the situation and think to yourself, you know what, maybe I'm the problem. Everyone that leaves that show in some way, shape or form has able has been able to get some sort of deal, right? Especially these two guys being the best examples because people always thought they were kind of Joe's lackeys. Joe's lackeys ended up getting a multi-million dollar deal with a pretty established streaming radio platformy kind of thing, right? And Joe hasn't still been able to do that he obviously got the patreon thing kicked off because of his you know sexual assault whatever thing he was being accused of before so that's an obviously an issue allegedly i don't know sure if that actually happened but you know people say these kind of things so maybe he's the problem in the end maybe the spotify deal was bad but maybe the way he dealt with that business dealings didn't really help the situation and in general you know they're basically relying on patreon money and adsense and that's it and really for somebody like a joe considering his history in the game he should have more than that to show for it right he should have multi-million dollar deals too especially considering the groundwork that he led he kind of laid for people especially in the hip-hop scene to thrive and succeed he really should have a bag um at the end of this but you know bit bad business deals having a stinky personality um fucking over your friends again uh, the, the, part of me thinks as well it shouldn't really matter pers in, in general but part of me wonders if the fact that he fucked over his close friends in such a public way has maybe made people you know um, hesitant on doing business with him in general I wonder I don't know what happened behind the scenes because he could say you know I've got Apple on my line da, da, da. but I wonder if that's actually affected him going forward because I know he's got the Facebook deal recently do that audio kind of clubhousey kind of thing but I don't know man I don't know but anyway Big up Rory Amal, very, very well done. Um, the picture and the article is fucking banging as well. They can use that for until the end of time in it that this person took. Like, that was fucking cool. So, yeah, big up them. Big up them. Anyway, that is the Excellent Show, episode number 507, I think I said, right? Um, if it's your first time, check out the show via YouTube. Please make sure you subscribe. Hit, no, hit subscribe if I've earned your follow. And, of course, hit the like. If you listen via the podcast, like, please give me a five-star review. I would greatly appreciate it. Until then, my friends, take care. Be safe and I'll see you again soon. Peace.